Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Michelle Scholes, and I'm an instructor here at the Environmental Learning Center at Clackamas Community College. Uh, and I'm coordinator of this program, which we have just, we're just completing our fourth year. So I'm very happy that you can all join us for wildlife and water friendly gardens. And today's workshop is called What Tree Should I Plant? Uh, I'd like to thank the sponsors of our program, um, in particular Clackamas Water Environment Services, who give us the financial support, and also to our partners who are Clackamas River Basin Council, Clackamas River Water Providers, Clackamas Soil and Water Conservation District, Greater Oregon City Watershed Council, North Clackamas uh, Watersheds Council, and Oak Lodge Water Services. So um, without further ado, I will turn over to our um, wonderful moderator, Alexis, who will introduce our speakers for today. Thanks. Thanks, Michelle. Yeah, welcome everybody. Um, as most of you are familiar with, the best practices here for Zoom are to stay on mute during the presentations. And if you have any questions, please type them and send them in via chat. I will be copying and pasting them over and be prepared to share them back with Drew and Eric at the end of our presentations today. Um, with uh, no further ado, it's my pleasure to get to introduce our speakers. So we have Eric Butler. Eric is the riparian specialist with the Clackamas River Basin Council. He's a landscape ecologist interested in protecting, restoring, and reconnecting ecosystems at the watershed scale. When not at work, he can usually be found volunteering on several boards and working groups, as well as teaching environmental science, recreating outdoors, or reading a good book. We also have Dr. Drew Zwart. Drew is a plant pathologist and physiologist and has been on staff at the Bartlett Tree Research Laboratories for 18 years. He conducts research and provides training and scientific support throughout Bartlett's Western operations, including Washington, Oregon, California, and British Columbia. Drew conducts research on plant stress physiology and plant disease and insect concerns. Drew is an ISA certified arborist, a certified track instructor, that's a tree risk assessment qualification instructor, and an ASCA registered consulting arborist. With no further ado then, um, we can go ahead, Drew, and get the screen share going for Eric's slides. And welcome everybody. All right, we can go ahead and start with Eric's slides and then Eric, you are good to go. So we're here today to learn all about why trees are <clears throat> why trees are valuable, but I really want to start out with kind of a watershed perspective, why trees are really important to not just our individual yards, but the whole landscapes we live in. And we can see in this graphic here that trees provide a lot of values to the places we live, that uh, they can reduce air temperatures in, which especially during some of these summer heat waves we've been experiencing recently can literally save lives, as well as large amounts of money and energy bills or air conditioning and such. Uh, they're also very good for air quality. They remove a lot of pollutants, they carbon dioxide, sequester carbon, help protect the climate, as well as removing a lot of things like ozone and particulates that are also impacting us. And so they and they intercept a lot of stormwater. And so having trees in our watersheds and in our urban spaces they really pay a lot, pay a lot of dividends. And it only costs a few hundred dollars to plant and establish a tree in an urban yard. And they can generate over sixty thousand dollars of benefits over their lifespan. And so planting trees is a really good return on investment. Next slide. However, trees are not equitably distributed throughout our spaces. There's a lot of this is for a lot of different reasons. There's a lot of variation in local tree policies and the amount that different communities and jurisdictions are investing in trees and tree care. It's also a wide range of attitudes about trees and different levels of understanding of their values among housing developers and property owners. And one of the biggest factors is that there's this long legacy of housing discrimination, a historical process that's often called redlining, where certain neighborhoods were identified as being higher risk, uh, less worthwhile areas. And this is where a lot of minority communities, a lot of working class communities, communities of color were steered. And these neighborhoods even 
half a century after these discriminatory policies were outlawed, still have really noticeable deficits in urban tree canopy. And so community-led tree planting and protection efforts was something that could really help change this. So if you're interested in learning more about this side of things, American Forests has their tree equity score tool, where you can see that there's mapping of uh, trees and uh, the conditions that they're helping and they're helping alleviate throughout urban areas all throughout North America. Uh, Friends of Trees is a local organization that's doing a lot of great things. And then uh, both Oregon Department of Forestry and the United States Forest Service have really active urban forestry programs. And so they have, they're another great resource to look at for more information and more things that you can do. And with that, I can turn it over to Drew. All right, thanks, Eric. That uh, dovetails perfectly into my presentation. I'm going to talk today um, about picking the right tree for your landscape. And, uh, you know, a lot of the benefits of trees we'll talk about not in any extensive detail, but some of them we've mentioned. So let's uh, get right into this. So um, basically the outline of what I'll talk about today is choosing a tree species that's right for your space and your objectives. Um, how, you know, some, some tips on planting your tree, getting your trees off to a, a good start uh, for a long, healthy lifespan and, and all the maximizing of benefits is important, obviously. And then uh, one of the major things that we see, especially with some of the weather events we, we've been seeing lately, uh, caring for young trees. So um, really choosing the tree species is the bulk of it. And then we'll get into those other items as well. So, Andrew, did you want me to yes. launch the poll right now? Uh, sure. Yeah, yeah. So um, the poll, as you see popping up, uh, is just one, I'm kind of want to get a sense for how people feel about native only sort of uh, whether they be mandates or, or actually municipal, municipal planting policy uh, versus just planting, you know, what is going to work that might not necessarily be native. Certainly we would encourage non-invasive um, even if it's not native, there's ways to determine if something's likely to become invasive. So looks like there's a pretty strong percentage so far as the numbers roll in towards, no, that's not necessarily a, a hard requirement. So that's good because some of the trees I'm going to mention today are certainly um, not native. So uh, one thing I'm not going to do today is just present you a list of trees that I think are good trees for your landscape because I've never been to your landscapes, mostly. I would assume. So, you know, really you shouldn't be selecting a tree out of a book. You shouldn't be selecting a tree based on what somebody else told you was a nice tree until you've already figured out if your site is going to be appropriate. So the selection of a tree species to put in the ground shouldn't just be based on some broad concept like, oh, it's drought tolerant, let's do it. Or it's a small, medium, power line friendly tree, let's do it. You really got to have a detailed site analysis of where are you going to put the plant focusing on not just your your broad environmental zone or your you know sunset or your um usda hardiness zones but looking at the microclimate um both above and below ground for exactly where you're putting that tree and so these generic lists don't take these specific site factors into consideration uh lists can also lead to uniformity you know i'm i'm not going to provide 150 different tree species although there's probably 150 out there that might work in a given spot so you know when when you start to have research scientists especially but anybody who's who's got some cloud in the industry talk about their favorite trees then that's what you start to find exclusively on the marketplace and and it becomes a sort of a limiting factor for diversity so I, this is a question that I'm going to answer myself or I'll, I'll tell you all what I mean by this 10, 20, 30 rule. There's a sort of a rule of thumb. I don't know that there's any hard data to support it, but there's a sort of rule of thumb in, in tree planting and in urban canopy surveys and, and in um, just generally surveys of, of large landscapes that you shouldn't have more than 10 percent of a given species. You shouldn't have more than 20 percent of a given genus and you shouldn't have it more than 30% of a given family of plants. And that's a, sort of a very broad general way to make sure you're, you're keeping a diverse forest um, or just yard. And, and, you know, it helps to avoid these massive wipeouts that we see when invasive 
disease or insect problems come to town. So whether it be Dutch elm disease, because the entire eastern part of the country had elms on every street, or now emerald ash borer, which the ashes were all planted to replace the elms. Um, and now they're being wiped out or have been wiped out in large parts of the country. So, you know, that lack of diversity can lead to major problems. Um, and there's also just hundreds and hundreds of good choices for every site. But if you can't find that tree, if you can't go out and buy it, then what what good is it for me to tell you some weird and wacky names? So I'm not going to talk about lists, but I'll talk about features of trees that you can look for. Um, and this is an example, and, and I have no, you know, animosity towards the authors of these papers, and I'm not trying to highlight this in a negative way. It just was an interesting, possibly correlation, maybe spurious correlation, maybe it's not actually connected, but there's a paper uh, years ago in the Journal of Arboriculture where they looked at the value, they placed a value on 10 different tree species. This was all in California. Um, they assessed the benefits of each species as it related to energy savings and air quality, a lot of the stuff that Eric mentioned earlier, carbon dioxide sequestration, storm water, um, and aesthetic value. And then they also assess the costs of those trees. So the general pruning needs of a given species, the lifespan, the cost for removal and replacement, uh, root related damage to infrastructure, uh, and then and then pest management, any, any sort of lethal pests that would have to be managed in order to keep that tree around. And, you know, with over the core, the 10 species that they looked at, there was some pretty big differences. So as far as the benefits, the good things, um, London plane tree was top of the list, followed closely by hackberry, so Celtis species, um, and also Modesto ash was up there. I think it would be a real mistake to plant ash uh, now that we know we have emerald ash borer in the area. Um, but, uh, you know, and some of the worst ones, thankfully, were flowering pear. Um, you know, so then when you looked at the costs, uh, as far as maintenance that, you know, London Plain had one of the lowest costs in, a, in addition to one of the highest benefits, the Modesto Ash kind of fell out a little bit because it had one of the higher costs associated with it, as did the Hackberry was sort of upper middle as far as the costs. So those that look good on the benefit side didn't look as good once you established the costs. Um, sweet gum or liquid amber, it was another one that had a high cost of upkeep and maintenance, mostly because they have such an aggressive root system. So when they looked at that benefit cost ratio, they found by far, oh, sorry, uh, by far is this upper column. You can see the London plane trees, when you look at that ratio, was almost or over triple uh, as beneficial versus cost as the other species. So just keep that in mind. London plane tree was the big winner here. Then about uh, 10 or 12 years later, the same group of researchers with USDA Forest Service in the Pacific Southwest Station, great researchers. I, again, I want to reiterate that I am not trying to bag on these this group of researchers. They do phenomenal work. Um, but this is just an example I came up with that, that they analyzed almost a million street trees across 50 cities in California 12 years after that initial study was published. And the only tree that broke that 10% species rule was London Plain. And I wonder if that's because of that earlier paper where everyone said all the municipalities, these are not street, these are street trees, sorry, they weren't uh, private property trees, but all the city planners and municipal arbor said, hey, the best cost benefit ratio is going to be London Plain. Let's put them all over the place. And that's then became the most overplanted tree. So, you know, just I'm, I'm wary of lists. So getting back to the main point here. Um, the first question I'll ask if somebody asks me what tree should I plant is what's what is the point? What is your objective with this tree? Is I just want a tree in my yard? Well, well, why? There's got to be something that you're looking for from that tree. So maybe it's aesthetics. Maybe you want flowers. Uh, I saw someone put desert willow in the chat earlier as their favorite species. This is a this is a fake desert willow I'm showing you here. It's a chalopsis, the real species. Uh, sorry, it's a chitalpa. Um, the real species desert willow is chalopsis, and I, I think it's a much better tree, but it might not be cold hardy, hardy up here. But anyway, flowering trees are, are really um, strong ones. Someone also put cherry blossoms in the chat. So flowers are a strong driving factor, just ornamental in general, interesting bark, interesting texture, interesting shape. Uh, fall color, maybe you have a bunch of evergreens and you want to add a little flair for seasonal variation. You know, there's a lot of different aesthetic reasons why you might want to plant a tree. And that's a good starting point for what to look for. 
uh, shade. You know, that was mentioned as one of the ecological benefits. Uh, obviously, you can reduce your cooling needs, reduce your carbon footprint and energy use uh, if you have planted a tree in the right place. Now, a tree on the on the northeast corner of your house isn't going to help you if that's your goal. A tree to the southwest corner probably will help you quite a bit. And it's got to be a tall tree, obviously, if it's going to give you shade. So there's there's some considerations that go along with that objective. Um, you know, maybe it's just a barrier. Maybe it's at the edge and you don't want to see your neighbor's house or you don't want to hear the street or you just want a little privacy for your hot tub back there. Uh, and that is a whole different function. They might not be that interesting, uh, but if it's evergreen and it's dense, then it's going to do the job. So uh, there's a lot of different considerations when picking a tree of what functions you want it to perform. And then the one that comes up quite a bit is, is to maximize any ecological services, any benefits that we can get from these trees. So again, as I mentioned, I'll say this a bunch of time, you should be selecting your species after a detailed site analysis. So, you know, site related items, the climate zone is sort of a big factor, but also sort of your microclimate, which side of the house, um, sun and wind exposure, uh, whether it's full sun, afternoon sun, morning sun, whether it's going to be fully exposed to wind or not. Um, how close it is to the house, how much space do you have, and then where in relation to the house is it? That becomes especially important if you're planting big trees or if you're looking to reduce your heating uh, needs, or sorry, cooling needs in the, in the wintertime, summertime. <laughs> uh, obviously, you want to look at volume both above and below ground. Uh, what limits are there to height? Is there a view issue if you plant something too tall? Is there going to be power line issues? Also, you know, are you going to have to do a ton of pruning to keep it in the space that you've allotted for it? So the, the ultimate height and width of, of these plants. Um, and this is one that I see all the time. I walk a lot of landscapes with arborists all up and down the West Coast. And something I see repeatedly is inappropriate mixing and matching of species where we see, you know, in California, it'd be a coast live oak. Up here, it might be something else, a gary oak that is very much um, drought tolerant, does not actually do well with a whole lot of summer irrigation. And then you'll see rhododendrons or azaleas or pieris or something that's a high water use species planted underneath it. And you're either going to harm the tree with too much water or you're going to have some ratty looking shrubs with too little water. Uh, you just really have to make sure your plant palettes are compatible with each other as far as their watering needs, their soil requirements and their shade tolerances and things of that nature. And then also known and expected pathogens and pests. So I mentioned it earlier, I think it would be a real shame to invest a lot of time and money planting an ash tree in the Portland area these days, just because emerald ash borer is here. We know it's 100% lethal to ash trees. There isn't an, a, a variety out there that you can plant and be safe. Um, so those are the kinds of things you can expect. There's a, there's a new Mediterranean oak borer that I'm not saying you shouldn't plant Gary Oaks because of it. Uh, but that's a concern. It's something you'll have to keep in the back of your mind. So whether it's already here or whether it's coming because it's all coming um, one day, it'll get here. You know, I know Portland had a management plan for Emerald Ash Borer years ago before it ever actually showed up. And that's a, a great idea. Um, so again, site analysis, we see a lot of soil related items. So the very most important item is just volume. How much space do you have for the roots? Uh, what is your pH? It's very hard to change pH, especially if you're not working with a plow in a field. And so you want to get a plant that's tolerant of your pH, whether you have salinity issues, which can come uh, naturally, or if you're using a lot of reclaimed water that can that can also be high in salts. What is your organic matter? What's your nutrient content? Some of these things can be addressed after the fact. Some of them are much more difficult. Um, your texture, your drainage, do you need to have something that can tolerate wet feet? Is it going to have to be something that can deal with, with a hard bulk density, a really compact soil? Again, you can change some of these things and not others. Uh, what's your surface cover? What are your understory plantings? Is, is there irrigation present or could you install it without, without causing yourself too much cost or uh, without running your water bills up too high or, or even where there's water restrictions? So, you know, I was asked, why is the, are these liquid ambers, which a client was told are virtually bulletproof, why are these things declining? They should be healthy forever. Uh, and then it's like, well, look at where you put it. Now, that asphalt, that concrete is new right up to the base of the plant, but they planted that tree within inches of a stone wall and they should have known they're going to run out of space eventually. So just above and below ground volume is, is really an important consideration for your tree selection. 
So you got to assess your soils. And this is a, um, a picture that we took. We were doing a project. This is an urban area. This is actually in Chicago. But we were sampling soils in, in front of residents um, in a Wicker Park neighborhood. But but each soil pit, it, or sorry, tree pit, tree planting site in front of each of these residences along the street, we took soil samples. And you don't have to do a major chemical analysis. You can look at those little cups of soil. Each one of those cups represents a different planting zone um, to see how different they are. So even in the same neighborhood, along along the same street, we have massive differences in what soil's there because none of it's native soil, right? This has all been influenced by development, by fill, uh, by construction, and all the rest of it. So, you know, speaking of ecological services, when you can, when you have good soil volume, when you have a lot of above ground space to work with and no power lines and, and no other concerns, go big when you can. So for just about every ecological service that Eric mentioned earlier, bigger equals better, whether we're talking about shade or windbreak or rainfall interception, filtering the air, sequestering carbon, habitat, whatever it is, generally speaking, the bigger, the better. So when you have space for it, don't put in something tiny, put in something big if you can. Um, I would also suggest that people consider uh, broadleaf evergreens. I know the Northwest is is flush with coniferous evergreens and, and you see them everywhere. Um, but I think that broadleaf evergreens are something that deserve more consideration. Uh, you know, when you look at it, this is an older inventory, but I was I found online a 2017 inventory just of street trees in Portland, and 92% of those trees were deciduous trees. So what? Well, I'll tell you what I think about that is that when you think about the benefits of trees, shade in the summer, a windbreak maybe in the winter, rainfall interception, filtering, assimilating CO2, habitat for wildlife, privacy, noise barrier, psychological help, all these things let's fast forward. It's winter. Deciduous trees, what do they do in winter? They lose their leaves. Well, you can take, you know, 80% of this list and scratch it off for three, four months of the year as far as these benefits um, when you're only planting deciduous trees or nine out of 10 trees are deciduous. You're losing a lot of these benefits for several months of the year. And the ones that are evergreen, whether they be conifers or broadleaf evergreens, they're taking advantage of that moisture in the winter. It's not that cold here. They don't go fully dormant. Um, and so you, you do see a lot of carbon assimilation still happening through winter months with these evergreens. So I wanted to run through just sort of an example of, of my thought process when I'm choosing a tree. Um, and, and again, I'm going to name some trees here. I think they're good trees, but they might not be good trees for you. So we'll say the objective here is that I want to fill a gap in the, in the landscape on the edge of the property between the house and a busy road. I don't want to see it and potentially I don't want to hear it. And I want to provide as many ecological services as I can in the process. So do my site analysis. There's plenty of volume. I've got soil to work with, above ground space to work with. There's no power lines. So I want something that's going to be quite large at maturity. I've got a full sun site, so I need to keep that in mind. I do have well-drained soil and I do not want to irrigate. And so I'm going to prefer a drought tolerant species. Uh, the soil looks pretty good from a deficiency standpoint, from a nutrient standpoint. The pH is pretty close to neutral. So I've got something to work with there. And we've got 3% organic matter. So that's pretty, pretty decent. We like to see five, but that's close enough. Um, so now taking these considerations, both the objective and the site factors into consideration, I'm going to plant a cork oak. So this, uh, this, this matches my goal of broadleaf evergreens. It's a large tree at maturity. It's an evergreen. It's a year round screening or barrier. Um, we're going to maximize a lot of these wintertime ecological services that I mentioned because of the evergreen nature. Um, and it's native to a dry summer climate. All right. So it is a Mediterranean tree. But when you get to the West Coast of the United States, I don't care if you're in Southern California on up to British Columbia, Western North America, I should say, we have extensive dry periods in the summer. So you need something that's adapted to that. We also know that cork oak isn't going to become invasive. So we got full hot, hot, full sun, hot, dry summers, wet winters. It's non-invasive. I think this is a great tree. A couple other items you might look at here. The reason why I put the picture of the foliage is that something that you can tell even if you don't know the species or where it's from you can tell a tree is going to probably be dry adapted when it's got this thick leathery green leaf dark green leaf with a really bright light underside that's all really fine hairs and that that qu 
quality of, of thick leaves, leathery leaves, and, and really her suit or hairy bottom side of the leaves. Those are two very good indicators that a tree is likely to have been evolved um, to be drought tolerant. So I'll go on a quick side note on oaks in general. I think that we should be looking at oak species a lot more, especially when people start talking about uh, climate change and climate ready trees. There are a huge variety of oaks out there from Southern California, Arizona, Texas, Mexico, um, that are really nice. And maybe not today, maybe not 20 years ago, but 20 years from now, I think will be very appropriate for the Pacific Northwest. Um, we've got evergreens, semi-evergreens and deciduous option, uh, options and a surprising variety, everything from what more or less look like shrubs on up to very, very large trees. So on the left there is a is a black oak. I think that's, that, that is a California native that would do well here. Um, next in line, we have this uh, coast live oak, which is a, one of my favorites. I know some designers don't like them. Uh, they do become a little bit litter intensive sometimes and then they drop acorns. And so, you know, you wouldn't want to put a patio right under it, but if you've got the space for it, that's a very drought tolerant tree. This next one with the red leaves is one of my current favorites. It's called Quercus rugosa. It's a net leaf oak. Um, that's a very drought tolerant oak. The foliage, when it first emerges, comes out this beautiful bright red, and then it hardens off and darkens to that deep green. And you can look and touch them, and they're very leathery, very hairy on the underside. That's a very drought tolerant tree. And then this last one on the right is a, a Mexican blue oak. That's another really nice one. And again, you can see that glaucous waxy appearance is another uh, indicator that a tree is very likely to be drought tolerant. <clears throat> So this is a site I work in in California, which is really cool because they're planting hundreds and hundreds of trees. And one of the things that we're going to be tracking over time are, are these underused, I'll say, not unknown, but certainly underused species. And <clears throat> the site where this sign, I just took this picture on Tuesday, is in Northern California, but I think it's applicable here as well, where they're looking at trees that are native to the area. They're looking at trees that are native to the West Coast, but maybe further south, um, on into Mexico. They're looking at some of the southeastern natives, and then they're looking at some sort of Mediterranean region natives. Uh, and they're planting them all on the same site uh, across a, a landscape that's pretty homogenous. And uh, we're going to track them over the next, you know, 10, 20 years and see which one of these are really worthwhile and which ones might have problems that we never would have suspected. Um, another option going back to my, my, um, objective of a screen with ecological benefits, a large drought tolerant tree, uh, evergreen full sun. I think the true cedars are a great tree and, and that's not anything new. You see them all over the place, but the Deodor and the, and the Atlantic, the blue Atlas cedars um, are beautiful trees. They mature very large. And from our experience of, of massive droughts in California, I can tell you uh, that they are very much drought tolerant and they are very much bark beetle resistant. And so both of these these species that I've sort of highlighted to fulfill my ob objectives, um, the worst thing you can do to them once they're established is water them. Uh, the, the only problems I've ever seen on a Deodora blue atlas cedar that was serious uh, or on a cork oak for that matter was overwatering leading to root disease. So um, these are definitely drought tolerant, but you can give them too much love if you're watering. So you wouldn't want to put, uh, you know, that mix and match water requirements into the understory. So just giving you a second example, we've got a new objective. I've got a Japanese maple and it died from verticillium wilt. We had it diagnosed. It's, so we know verticillium is in the soils. Um, so obviously one of my uh, goals will be to plant a tree that's resistant or, or immune. Um, it's ornamental. I want to basically, you know, perform the same objectives as that Japanese maple I lost. So it's ornamental. It's small to medium size. It's got some interesting foliage, maybe some variegation, maybe flowers, but I just want something to look at. I don't just want a green blob in the corner of the yard. So small space, I don't have much root zone and I don't have much space above ground. It is shaded in the afternoon. Um, I already have some azaleas and rhododendrons there that I don't want to remove and I want everything to play nice together. Uh, given that I, I know what I'm doing with planting rhododendrons and azaleas, we have a lo much lower pH here of 5.2 and medium, not the greatest drainage. It gets a little bit wet, but it's also not saturated all the time just during heavy rains. 
And again, we know verticillium is in the soil and I also don't have any fences. So I wanna make sure that I'm not planting something that's just gonna get chomped up by deer. So again, that's a lot of detail in the site analysis portion um, as far as where do I go from here? And so in this case, after going through my list of, of what fits with all these different uh, factors, I'm looking at a chase tree, a Vitex. This is one of my absolute favorites. Um, it's a small deciduous tree. It's got long lasting, very showy flowers. Pollinators just absolutely love this tree. Um, it's very similar in form and even in leaf arrangement to Japanese maple, but it's far more resistant to both verticillium and phytophthora root rot. And then it's also deer proof. Deer just absolutely won't touch this thing. So um, this I think is a really good choice and it's a medium water user. So I might give it a little more water than it needs if I'm keeping my azaleas and rhododendrons healthy, or maybe I'll just let my rhododendrons and azaleas be a little thirsty sometimes, but either way, those are gonna be compatible with each other. So, you know, going through that thought process, this is, this is what I landed on. But Again, I'm not saying everyone should go out and plant Vitex, uh, but it's a good tree. <laughs> Another option that would fit the same site, and again, it's a California native, but it would do well here, is the California Buckeye. So much smaller than your horse chestnuts that you see all over the place, much smaller even than the, the um, sort of the Buckeye of the East Coast, the red or pink flowers, very drought tolerant, absolutely verticillium resistant, very showy flower. The only thing I would say about this tree, it's cool. It leaves out very, very early. Um, probably by now it's in full leaf, even here. It'll be in full leaf by March. Um, but it also, when it gets very hot and dry by the end of the year, it starts to senesce much earlier than other deciduous trees. So this thing will brown out, doesn't have tremendous fall color, um, but that you know early spring through midsummer, it's a, it's a really nice little tree. So anyway, that's just another option that fulfills all the same goals that I was talking about with this little exercise. So uh, moving from this, you know, just to tie a bow on this, choose a tree based on the function, the goal, the objective that you're looking to get out of this tree. Um, a detailed site analysis is really necessary to make sure your tree isn't struggling the whole time. Or, you know, when they're young and vigorous, they usually look pretty good. And then you get up to 20, 30 years down the line and you got a lot of decline happening. So know your site, know what's coming. Uh, and then also find the plant you want. And this is something that I see all the time where somebody didn't want to go outside the big box store. They just wanted to go get a tree on a Saturday morning, buy it, dig a hole, plant it and be done with it. And it's it's just you're, you're not going to be happy with that. And the selection is going to be a lot lower. And even though it may cost you a little more to ship a tree from somewhere a little further away than just going and driving and picking it up. In my mind, you know, other rather than being unhappy with your plant selection or having to remove and replace the thing three or four times, spend the extra money, take the extra time to actually source the thing that you absolutely want. And I'll give you an example of that. Years ago, I was at an arboretum that I can't remember where. And, and I like Cirsus. Somebody also mentioned Redbud. I think Alexis actually said her school was Redbud School. But, um, you know, I love Cirsus. But I don't think Circus canadensis, the eastern redbud, is a great selection for the west coast. I don't find the native um, California redbud, the occidentalis, to be all that interesting. Um, and, and I and I kind of like the uh, the reniformis, the Texas or the Oklahoma redbud. Um, so I was at an arboretum and I saw this alley cat. It's a variety. I want to say it was canadensis, but it might have been reniformis. But either way, it had just these amazing leaves. I love variegated leaves. And it was growing in an area that was pretty dry. And it was July when I saw it. And it hadn't scorched. It hadn't dropped leaves. And so I felt pretty comfortable that it might be drought tolerant and heat tolerant. Although usually variegated leaves are more susceptible to those stresses than straight species leaves. But that's a different story. So it took me three years to find this tree. I finally found it. It cost me more to ship it then it cost me to buy it, but I did it anyway because I wanted this tree and now it's growing happily in my yard and I'm, and I'm psyched to have it. <laughs> and, and it hasn't scorched yet. I've only had it for a year now and it hasn't scorched yet, but we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, oh, that's beautiful. Um, you're at the 10 minute mark. So I wanted to let you know. Um, oh, great. Thank you. And what tree is this called again? Cause that is awesome. It's the variety. It's Circus. I don't remember the species, but it's alley cat is the variety. If I'm remembering correct, I'm 99.9% .9 sure that's right. Um, okay, so planting your tree. So setting your tree up for success, wider, not deeper holes are better. 
Always make sure this root collar or root flare area is above grade. And a lot of times, whether it's ball and burlap or whether it's uh, a containerized tree, nursery practices being what they are, you're going to buy trees where the root flare is buried, sometimes under just a little bit of mulch, sometimes under inches of, of rooting media or soil if it's field dug. So, you know, really make sure that you're planting it at the right level at grade and make sure that these flares are above grade. Also, look at the root system. Fix defects before you plant the tree. We see large tree failures all the time, and it all comes back to circling roots that were never corrected at planting. So cut some roots, bust up a root ball if it's a containerized plant, and splay those roots out. And we actually did some research on this years ago at our site in Charlotte, where we planted four or five different species um, we, we compared what we were calling root ball manipulation, which frankly was root ball destruction um, versus uh, just taking it out of the of the pot and putting it in the ground and burying it. And so we busted up the root ball. We splayed out the roots. It absolutely took longer to plant these trees than it did to just pop them out and put them in. Um, but in the long term, growth, health and stability, stability paid off. So. Um, you know, this is my colleague, Eldon Lebrun, really going after these root systems. We were cutting off significant portions of these roots and we really had minimal, maybe, maybe two in, in 50 trees died. Um, so then, as you can see, that was a potted plant that we basically bare rooted and unpotted and splayed the roots out. Um, <clears throat> and then, so we had them in the ground and monitored their growth and their overall health for seven years um, out of the pot into the hole after one year looked better. All right. They just hadn't had that disturbance of the root zone. But by year two, the disturbed trees had caught up and now were growing faster and, and canopy condition was better. And that continued on all the way to uh, year seven. And at year seven, we dug them all. This is a, a destructive harvest. And um, we dug them all, used an air device to blow out the root system so we could really take a look. And, and you can see what happened. Now, this is a maple. This is kind of an extreme example. But on the trees that we didn't touch, we just put in the ground. You see this ball that actually acts like a socket, ball and socket joint, where it can tip over very, very easily. You do have some roots out here, um, but, but you do have a really massive knotted up, circling, potentially girdling roots. Whereas on the ones that we really busted up and splayed out, they all looked pretty good. I didn't just cherry pick the worst and best to show these pictures. Um, if you look at the data, there's very little variation in the data, um, but you can see that there's a much nicer distribution of roots, much stronger, more structurally uh, advanced tree there. So the other thing I want to talk about is young tree pruning, and this is absolutely critical as we see more and more heavy snow loads and, and more and more ice storms where you can correct problems with tree structure early, a lot easier, a lot cheaper than late. So commonly ignored, but it's massively important for long-term structure and safety, remove or suppress codominant leaders and fix the early branching patterns to get a better distribution radially and, and vertically of branches. And again, a few early cuts, not at planting. Uh, I think the research is pretty clear that you don't prune the canopy at planting. You want to let that tree come to balance on its own. You need as much green material up there to feed the root system as possible, um, get those carbohydrates, get established. But after a year or two in the ground, a few cuts can make a big difference. So pruning young trees is easier, cheaper, less damaging to the tree, smaller carbon footprint, all the rest of it. And co-dominant stems are probably the, the number one form of failure. And we see a lot of failures on big trees, but this picture in the middle is not a big tree. That's only a four to five inch diameter tree. And you could say it was it was 100% codoms. They were exactly the same size. And it wasn't even, this is in California. There was no snow. There's no ice. This was just wind that pulled this tree apart. On the right, that was one I took in Seattle after a, a snowstorm. And again, you can see the included bark, which is very common with codominant stems. And it just splits apart. That's the most common form of failure of larger trees. And it can certainly be addressed when trees are old through pruning, but it's much easier when they're young. So the other thing, branch distribution I talked about, when you see trees where all of the major limbs are coming from the same spot on the trunk, it is going to be a problem. That's also going to form a cup or a bowl, a basin where organic matter and water can collect and lead to top down decay into that union. But just the union itself is going to be weak because it's just all the branches coming from the same spot. It's really common in pear. Um, this other tree was actually a, a 
a box elder, but but they fell apart because the branches were all coming from the same spot. So, you know, this is a tree that was planted. It's a little elm, good species for the location. It's obviously got lots of spaces that are arboretum. Literally two cuts, all right? Two snips with a hand pruner. And this tree is a heck of a lot better for the long-term structure and form than two cuts previously. So really doesn't take a lot um, to fix a tree early and not cutting into heartwood, not making massive wounds, just, just fixing it early. So again, this is a few more than two cuts, but we took this red maple and with the hand pruners, no lift, no climbing, no chainsaws, no chippers, no chip trucks, everything would fit in your green bin. And this tree on the right, I mean, it's obviously the same tree, but now it is set up for, for a long life and, and limited branch failure potential compared to this one where there's like six different iterations of, of codominance that needed to be addressed. And then you can remove or you can prune later in life but you're gonna start hitting heartwood. And when you start cutting into heartwood, you get more decay. So, you know, on the left, there are some, some red oaks that you can see, those are big, big cuts. That was in response to a failure. Um, the, the client got scared and just wanted every big branch cut off. This one on the right is not a big tree. That's again, that's maybe an eight inch diameter elm, but that cut was big enough to expose heartwood and that's going to lead to decay. And again, when you when you get into heartwood, there's no active dispense. Heartwood is technically more decay resistant than sapwood, but sapwood has active defenses. The rays can can you know the whole compartmentalization of decay theory um, is is focused on the sapwood and the non heartwood parts of the tree. And that heartwood, you know, it decays. We've all seen tree with, with central columns that decay. The heartwood is not as decay resistant as people make it out to be. And it is when you expose it through pruning, you're, you're asking for trouble. So young tree pruning and, uh, and planting it right will get you on your road. So what tree should I plant? Identify your objectives and the functions of the tree. Identify any site-specific factors or limitations. I show this picture of an American chestnut because I, that's the reason why I became a plant pathologist was the story of the American chestnut. I planted one at my house, which seems crazy because I talked about known problems and the chestnut blight is obviously a well-known problem, but I don't think there's going to be any spores finding my chestnut tree from the East Coast. So I'm pretty, pretty comfortable that I'm out of range of that disease. Um, choose the species and then find it. Get what you want. Don't settle. That's my that's my advice. Um, plan it right. Take a little extra time, especially if you're just planting one tree in your own yard. You got plenty of time. You got all weekend. So do it right. And then any structural defects, it's cheaper and easier and better for the tree to correct them sooner than later. Um, so that's uh, that's that. So I'm happy to uh, take any questions. Hopefully we're pretty close on time there. Yeah, we really are. This is great. Thank you so much, Drew. Um, I'm going to pin back. Um, oh, I want to also keep your video going. Did we lose you on camera? Oh, I think my camera's still on. We did. My view just changed. It's my settings. I'm a little confused. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you. Yeah, we have some great questions coming through. Uh, let's see. One of the things that you were just talking about was the co-dominant leaders. Mm -hmm. um, is cabling a practice that is still done for older trees with co-dominant leaders or, or recommended? Absolutely. Yeah, it's got to be done right. Cables, once they're installed, um, need to be regularly monitored to make sure they're still functioning, that they're not pulling through the wood, they're not... Uh, rusting or, or becoming otherwise impaired, but cabling is very much part of the national standards for arboriculture. Um, there are, there's a whole chapter in this, in the ANSI A300 standards for cabling embracing. And uh, it's, it's absolutely a practice that's still, still done. Um, not, not frowned upon in the arboriculture industry, as long as it's done right. Thank you. Um, you were talking about in arranging root balls, at the time of planting or breaking up the root balls, disturbing them so that things are evenly distributed and like correcting any damage issues. What would you say for trees that have been um, planted already like a season or a few seasons ago? Is it worth 
digging in and disturbing them to fix the roots or would you um, leave them once they're in place? You know, it, it really depends. I, I would say it's worth taking a look, um, whether it's very carefully with a trowel or whether it's with like a compressed air device or something. I, you know, obviously just right at the base. If you see circling roots that are touching the trunk and seem to either be already girdling or have the potential to girdle, I would cut those immediately. What, no matter how long the tree's been in the ground, um, I would cut them. You know, there's there's some debate about how much of a girdling root you can cut before you're, you're doing too much. Uh, but honestly, that's going to become a, a weak spot and it's going to either lead to decline or tree failure. So certainly circling roots... I would say address anytime you find them, regardless of the life stage of the tree or how long it's been in the ground. With some of the other just little defects, um, I, I think you're going to have a much harder time finding them once the tree's already been in the ground. So that'll be more difficult. Thank you. Um, you spoke about true cedars being really hardy and, and drought tolerant and everything. Are they susceptible to wind and ice breakage? Um, some are and some aren't. Those two, the Deodor and the Blue Atlas are from um, mountainous regions that have snow, probably not as much ice as far as freezing rain. But again, any tree that has long overextended branches, regardless of species, is going to be prone to breakage. But that is also easily addressed through good structural pruning. That would be a lifetime, not just right at planting or, or a year after planting that I was mentioning earlier, but, you know, reducing that end weight, making sure you're not lines tailing trees, not stripping out the middle and only leaving all that weight at the end. Those are all our practices that will help to reduce any chance for failure in those uh, ice storms. Thank you. Um, all right. And then we have several kind of specific questions to people's sites. I think people are really eager to pick your brain. Um, and so I've had a couple questions come through with like specific questions or site conditions. Okay. Um, so for everybody that's still here, um, the the chat is still open for over for for more questions. I only have a couple more. Um, it looks though like Amy just sent one in that is is picking up on what we were just talking about first year. So her her Dudar cedar keeps losing its top in the wind and she was wondering if there's anything she can do. Um, it's it's losing its top like it's breaking out. Yeah, it like blows it blows out in in the I've lost the top two or three times. And then it re-sprouts and then blows out again. Right. Hmm. You know that that is exceedingly rare, I'll say. <laughs> I don't see that. I, a lot of times you see them flatten out naturally when they kind of reach the height uh, that that matches the water availability. They'll sort of flatten out and stop growing up. Um, but I, it ha was it topped sometime long ago and then it was the re-sprouts that keep breaking because that wouldn't surprise me but if it was part of the original um central leader that i i've not seen that so i, I don't know much to comment on it yeah it, it it never was topped but um and to be honest i can't see the top of it so it seems like it's the top that keeps blowing out um but i can't be sure that it's not a branch near the top yeah yeah, no, I mean, once, whether it's naturally or by somebody's tool, like it's been top, then every new top on there is going to be more poorly attached. But uh, again, I, I can't say I've seen a lot of those trees. I've not seen that happen necessarily. So I can't really speak to it. Okay, thanks. Back to trimming roots. When trimming the circular roots, what about the tap root? What if it's cut? You know, an old physiology professor told me that tech, tap roots only exist in textbooks. And when you look at trees in nature, if the soil allows for it, you will see tap roots or sinker roots. But the nursery practices being what they are, they're almost always cut at some point during the production cycle. Um, and so I, I don't think tap roots, there are sinker roots that form later, but a true tap root is, is really quite rare unless it's a native grown tree, like never been in the nursery practice um, and, and grew from seed or from acorn or whatever. So, you know, it, it's unlikely you're going to find a true tap root. Uh, but if you do, you're, you know, millions and millions of trees have been planted without tap roots and are fine. So I, I'm not concerned about that necessarily. I wouldn't dig like a 13 foot hole just to accommodate a tap root. I'll say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Okay. Now I think coming into some of the more specific questions, um, 
Someone was interested in planting a cedar, but they live on the Oregon City Plateau where some western red cedars are taking a hit due to drought, especially in the upland areas. And they were wondering, what about an incense cedar? You know, incense cedar, that's one of those pest prone ones. Incense cedars, especially as we get warmer and a little bit more stressful, we're going to see more and more of it, but they get a disease called ceridium canker. It's sometimes referred to just as cypress canker, but that's a that's an, a well-known, prevalent, omnipresent uh, fungus that will kill branches one by one by one by one of incense cedars. We don't really see incense cedars out of range in California anymore because they've already gone that direction. So I think an incense cedar you can get away with up here a little bit longer, but that's a high elevation species, right? That that doesn't belong somewhere where there aren't cold, hard winters. And so you're going to see ceridium canker on an incense cedar. I would go with a true cedrus species. Thank you. And that question came through earlier before you started talking specifically about some of those. So I'm sure they were taking notes. Um, I was going right, to add so to that as well. I have seen historically well-established incense cedars do really well in the Willamette Valley. But again, if there's emerging disease issues, that might be something to reconsider at low elevations. I've, I've planted incense cedars with some forestry clients who've been struggling with with things that are hard to grow on commercial scale. But again, it's kind of mixing that in with other species and using as kind of one member of a portfolio. But it's something that you're really kind of depending on for a, a single landscape tree. That's kind of an interesting question. Thanks, Eric. Yeah. And that was perfect. I was able to repin your guys' videos. I got distracted by things not looking the way I expected. So now you're back. <laughs> um, all right. And then someone wrote in from Polk County um, and they were explaining that the contractor in their subdivision planted paper birch. Um, so <laughs> you already chuckled. Um, so they planted them three in a group. They've been seeing, you know, branches breaking during the ice storms. Some are dying. Some are being removed. What do you think about paper birch? Yeah, they're weak. You know, ice storms will snap them. Absolutely. They're wispy sort of tree form. The other thing is those groups of three or groups of five that you see are not a true three stem tree. That's three cuttings that were jammed into a pot and allowed to root together. And we see that there's a couple of different species. That's a really common nursery practice is to just jam three in the same pot and call it a triple stem. And those, as they get bigger, just physically push away from each other because it's not the same tree. Um, and those roots are entangled. And we often see three stem birches that only have two or only have one because one of them sort of dominated and pushed the other two away to the point of failure. So I, I think that's a really poor tree choice. Um, they also have a known pest. You know, there's a native bronze birch borer that just smokes trees that are under drought stress. And our native river birch is, is a quite a bit more resistant. It's not immune, but it's quite a bit more resistant. But any of those European or Asian um, birches are highly susceptible to bronze birch borer. So that's like a triple whammy, uh, poor choice in my book. <laughs> they look nice though for a while. And speaking of birch, if a tree has initial damage from bronze birch borer, should the tree be removed or should it kind of be stuck with and remove the damage for as long as possible? I'd say that's a that's a personal valuation there. You know, there are treatments that will keep that tree alive for a very, very long time. If it's just in the initial stages of being attacked by insects, um, those treatments are systemic insecticides. If you're opposed to that, then you're going to end up removing and that replacing that tree sooner or later anyway. Um, if you're not opposed to that, you could probably keep that tree alive. But in addition to bronze birch borer, we're going to see increasing, just like with the Western Red Cedars, we're going to see increasing um, drought and heat stress on these trees. So it's going to be more than one factor stressing those things out long term. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Let's see. I'm trying to decide which more specific question to ask next um there's a couple questions like some folks are asking and have some uh, like parameter site parameters in common particularly some folks looking at something less up to or less than 25 feet um so someone was asking for a tree for a small yard they mentioned that oak is too big for their space um but that's just one parameter. So maybe I'll segue that one into the one that came through with more details for you, which is okay. again, looking for trees up to 25 feet um, in a small 
looking for a small native tree for the Portland, Oregon area, clay soil, mostly sunny spot, ideally berry forming for birds. Hmm. You know, I would say something in the Ericaceae, maybe, you know, a, a manzanita or a madrone or, um, a, you know, obviously the native madrones get quite large. So if you're not married to native uh, trees, then there's some hybrids and some some strawberry tree. Arbutus unato is a nice tree and, and birds really love those fruit. Um, <clears throat> you know, the first thing that came to mind before the native part, uh, was this parodia, the Persian ironwood are really nice trees that'll fit that spot. Um, oh, yeah, there's, um, my mind is going more to non-native. So, so I'm thinking that really that, uh, that palette of ericaceous family is probably the best for that purpose. Yeah. I saw, I saw a couple of people said, put suggestions in the, uh, in the chat about that as well, like choke cherry or cascara, a couple that are recommended. Those are two that I really like uh, for that kind of situation. Um, yeah. I mean, cas they're both pretty versatile. Cascara tends to be more of kind of a woodland riparian kind of tree, so it's won't do quite as well in a really stressed or like a high stress urban setting. But something like choke cherry is sort of a it's typically a more of a desert or high desert species that you sometimes see in the valley. So it's a good choice. A set of crab apples, another one that might do well. Well, thank you. And for that same site, um, Drew, they said they would also appreciate ideas for a word that I'm not sure if I'm going to pronounce correctly, fastigiate, fastigiate. Yeah, uh, fastigiate. Yeah, I, you know, um, these days, just about any tree you can find a fastigiate variety of. Um, certainly there's some fastigiate uh, protea that I mentioned earlier that are coming out. Um, I know of a nursery in Washington that grows them and they're actually being planted as street trees, which is rare for that species because usually is spreading. Um, there's some a uh, hornbeam that, that are nice fastigiate varieties that would do well in, in a lot of settings. There's even old school ones like English oak. There's a lot of straight up varieties of those. Um, so I would say that, that more and more you're able to find just about anything you're looking for. You, if you look hard enough, you'll be able to find a fastigiate variety. Pardon me. Awesome. Thank you. That brought us through our list. So I will just put our evaluation link or our list of questions. I mean, um, unless other questions start to come through, I'm just going to put our evaluation link in chat. We know we've been sending that in every week and we do really appreciate, uh, your feedback that helps us plan out next year's workshop series as well. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions come through, so I think we might be good to go ahead and wrap up. Drew, thank you so much. Um, and Eric, thank you too for, mm -hmm. for contributing. Um, this has been a really, really good one. They always are. <laughs> oh, yes. Thank you, everybody, for I, I must say, because it's the last one. This is Michelle. Um, thank you all for um, participating this year. And for I would reiterate, you know, when I'm planning what we're going to talk about next year, if you have any ideas or you think of any later, please forward to me for things that you'd like to learn more about, because um, it's, it's always fun to try and uh, get answers to gardeners um, on what they actually want to hear about. Um, this was an absolutely wonderful um, presentation. Very, very useful. I think I'm going to have to watch it again. And, and just as a reminder, the recording link will be going out um, in the next week. So thank you all. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Drew. And thanks, Alexis, for your wonderful moderating. And hopefully we will see you all back here next year for year five, I guess. Yeah. I might just put out a, a an action item for those of you that are interested in volunteering. A lot of organizations have a lot of things going on right now. It is that time of year. I know the Clackamas River Basin Council has a cleanup coming up in a couple of weeks. That's going to be Eric's organization. Um, Deep Pave has some great replanting series coming up. Mm -hmm. um, my the Environmental Learning Center yeah. has a Saturday work parties every week, Perfect. every month. <laughs> I was like bringing up a different organizations tabs. I, I'm sure they have something. I'm sure they have something and they didn't get to the ELC. So, and then there's also in Clackamas County, a couple sites for the watershed wide event with Tryon Creek this weekend. So for those of you that are interested in getting to know who else in your community is, is interested in promoting wildlife and water friendly practices outside of our gardens, but also in our shared community spaces and natural areas, there's a lot of great ways to get involved. 
Okay, thank you, everybody. Uh, enjoy the sunshine out there. And uh, thanks again. All right, take care. Bye-bye.